1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today's Chaplain Report is going to come from the Psalms, and it has a lot to do with what we were talking about with the Equality Act with Matt Clark. And there's an important reason why this is a battle worth having. And I don't even necessarily just mean politically. I mean as a society, as a people. There's a reason that this fight is worth having. Because at its core, and I alluded to this while I was talking to him, at its core, the whole transgender movement, the whole homosexual movement, it all goes back to one thing. They don't believe that they are an important, precious soul that God created in a specific way to fulfill a purpose. So many of these people on the transgender side, a common line, a common explanation for why they are the way they are is, well, I was born in the wrong body. Or I feel as though I'm not really the person that my body says that I am, and therefore I can make sex and gender malleable, and I can be whatever I want it to be. So I'm going to look at a verse today that is very often used in a different way that I want to sort of adjust the perception that we're seeing to get a, a different message. I don't think that it's that the other message is incorrect, but I just want to look at it from a different perspective, and hopefully that'll help us flesh out the message that it's trying to convey. This comes from Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now, looking at, at this particular passage, we often use this as a justification for God having formed children in the womb before they actually are born, and that talking about him imparting that spark of the divine, the soul, into the human being when conception takes place. That is not an incorrect analysis. It is not an incorrect understanding of that verse by any stretch of the imagination. That is definitely a lesson we can take from it. But sometimes I think we have an unfortunate tendency, and I probably do the same thing. We have an unfortunate tendency to, with a passage of Scripture that we're familiar with, we think, oh, we've got that one. We understand what that one is saying. And because of it, when we read through the verse, we sometimes ignore another biblical truth, another message or piece of wisdom that God is trying to impart with said message because we think, well, we've got that one down. There's no reason to give it a second look. And it's not as though we academically reason that out in our head. It's just kind of an instinct. And so even though I think that the common understanding of that verse is absolutely accurate, what else does it say about us? Is there another message that we can take away? To me, it's one of the strongest evidences against this idea that you can be, quote-unquote, born in the wrong body. Because if you look at the way that God forms us, he creates us in such a way that it's intentional. That he wants us to do exactly what it is that he tells us. And that's the reason that really homosexuality and other sexual sins that involve sort of gender bender kind of ideas, the reason that they're sinful is because they are a rejection of God's gifts. God put me in a male body for a reason. There is a good reason that he had, that he had in his mind ahead of time for my life, that he made me a man. And that is true of every other man that has ever walked this earth. And it's true in reverse for every woman that has walked this earth. 
Gender is something that is not arbitrary, that God doesn't just flip a coin, all right, man, all right, woman. There is a purpose in that. That purpose may be for ourselves, or it may be relational, so that we can have a relationship in a certain way with other people. That's certainly a possible application of this. But the point is, God doesn't make mistakes. And when he made us, he did so in a specific way to serve a specific purpose. Just like he made Adam a man and Eve a woman, he made all of us men and women for a good reason. And part of that reason carries over into the idea of homosexuality being a sin. He made us male and female, and the two were supposed to work together, complement one another, and be in relationships with one another in a way that they're not with other human beings. And so to do anything other than God's plan is a rejection of his gift. And much in the way that other sins are a rejection of his gift, just like sleeping around before you're married, just like lying is an abuse, or it's, it's taking away from the gift that God gave you, it's an abuse of the free will that he gave you. These things are perversions in the same way. In reality, any sin could be said to be a rejection of what God intended for your life. It's essentially, when you boil it all down, every sin that you make, every intentional sin that you engage in is you saying, you know what, Lord, I know better than you. I can make decisions better than you can. And that's part of the reason that the Scripture tells us that those who have understood the gospel, that those who know God and understand his law, those are the ones that are going to be judged more harshly if they do not adhere to said law. Because we're the ones that are supposed to know better. And so to embrace, whether it's being a man or being somebody that has a particular gift that can be used for the kingdom, whatever it may be, accepting who you are and accepting the gifts that God gave you and the position, whether it's position in life and social status or in the abilities that you have been given, accepting that is part of accepting the way that God made you and put you here to do a specific purpose. You see, the master potter makes different vessels for different reasons. He makes some for common use, he makes some fancy, he makes some for some utilitarian purpose, and we all have that purpose, and we have to do our best to figure out what that purpose is. That's our true mission in life. And if we do that, we are living in the way that God always intended us to be. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. God doesn't make people inadequate for their purpose. In the same way, if he needed a flathead screwdriver, he wouldn't make a Phillips head, because that wouldn't work. He made us for a specific reason, because he loves us, because he wants us to be useful to him. And that is living a life that is truly fulfilling. When we're fulfilling our purpose, we understand who we are. That's true freedom. That's true independence. And that's truly living the way that God intended for us to. Stay the course, friends. Hey, to make sure you get all the updates, you need to go ahead and subscribe and click that little notification bell down there. That gets you a notification every time I post a new Bible lesson or political commentary. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't subscribe, it's because you hate America and Jesus. But I can't think of any other reason you wouldn't subscribe.